Good afternoon in Asia and good morning in Europe and the US. In the US it's about 4, 10 in the morning. And in Europe, I think it's about, um, what time is it in Europe? In London it's 9.11. So welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for taking your time uh, to, um, to join this talk. And of course, I'd like to thank Katy and Laika for inviting me. Uh, to share my uh, my experiences, my story on the Japan tsunami. tsunami. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, my experiences in Japan when I covered the um, earthquake and tsunami. On 2011, uh, March 11, uh, and uh, I heard about the uh, earthquake and the tsunami. Um, I was given an assignment. So three days later, I took the flight and uh, went to Tokyo. Uh, from Tokyo, um, I fi find my way by road to go to um, the Miyagi site on the Sendai. Go to Sendai and try to get into Fukushima. Um, so, just to give you an idea, what is it like um, going into such disaster area? Yeah. Um, it's not easy in terms of uh, traveling because all, people always think that in general that uh, you know it's it's so um, so easy to to get access and to move around and um, you know in and people always think that you know it's uh, it's cheap to travel it's the other way around so if you cover disaster or what on country uh, everything goes up and uh, traffic is hard to move around as well so how do you get there in the first place um, sorry, how do I get there yeah. um, I went by all means of transportation okay. uh, took the train uh, took the bus uh, even to, came to a point I uh, even got a push bike a bicycle Oh. Uh, where I wanted to go. So, um, but my, on my first trip, when, when I went to Japan to, um, to do this coverage, I was pretty new at it uh, because a you know, disaster doesn't tell you when it's going to happen. Yeah. So I went in without much research. You know, I mean, I've covered numerous disasters, but uh, what really caught me off guard was the, um, the meltdown of the Fukushima uh, Daiichi power plant, which I didn't know much about it at that time about nuclear. Okay. So, as um, so this was what happened when the Fukushima Daiichi power plant exploded. So you got a thirty meter, thirty kilometers range of uh, the radiation level. So I was caught in between uh, near. Uh, this area, Futaba. Okay. So as just as I was going in, everybody was evacuating. So at that moment, um, to me, it was like seeing in the movie. You know, if you watch in the movie, you know, you see people evacuating, and and uh, you know, so the scene was, you know, like how I saw like a movie. You know, I was like, am I dreaming? You know. Yeah. Um. So I and the Everybody were, were evacuating. I was going. I was going in, and I met a few people, and uh, they they transported their, their their pets, their dogs, their cats. So they took with them, you know, to whatever they could. So, of course, as as a photojournalist, my my instinct is going in, you know, to to cover the uh, the crisis, um, but it was impossible because. Um, uh, I was getting news from the the United Nations, and I was getting news from the Japanese government. Um, the Japanese government was saying it was three kilometers evacuation zone. Uh, the U United Nations was saying ninety kilometers, so it was it was very very confused. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I went in, but um, I got stranded. Um, I had a vehicle and uh, we ran out of gas. Uh, there was no gas at all, no petrol. 
So um, I end up staying uh, in a place uh, where I, someone housed me. Um, and I found my way back because it was impossible to get in. I didn't have uh, proper gear at that time. I didn't have a uh, uh, mask for radiation, soup, so nothing, you know. I didn't even have a Geiger counter. So this is a Geiger counter. So okay. this Geiger counter, what it does, it reads your radiation level. Yeah, so this is, this is my only source of my, uh, that tells me whether the radiation is high, yeah. is safe or not. But at that time, when a Fukushima power plant exploded, uh, it was unexpected. I mean, the people knew the meltdown was, was, was happening, but didn't expect there was an explosion. So, so this is, um, gives us an idea of the, the tsunami, the earthquake and tsunami that took place right from the top, up north, mm. right down south. So that's how you stretch. So um, that's Sendai to get in there. Yeah. yeah. And Tokyo is there. So there was no flight uh, going to Sendai at that time. Yeah. So, so from here, I got to Tokyo, I took a bus. You know, so at that, at that time, the furthest I could go was, uh, you know, just right, uh, just before Fukushima. Okay. Yeah. So it was impossible to pass, you know. Then I worked my way around to get into Sendai. So from Sendai, I moved around. So these are all the affected areas. So the, me the place was so massive that um, you can't be covering every part of it. So I, I did whatever I could to cover the, uh, the most um, uh, affected areas. Were you afraid? I mean, you see people running out and then you are like uh, trying to go in. No, I... Afraid is... is I wouldn't say I was... Um, I was afraid in a certain thing, certain ways that I wasn't sure. I was unsure. Mm. So that's sort of that sort of afraid, you know. I wasn't afraid of the, the you know something's gonna happen to me. Yeah. I mean, I was afraid more. Of, I was unsure of the the uh, nuclear uh, problems because um, um, I, I'm sure you know for a lay person we wouldn't know, you know. So until it happens and you do your study, you do your research. Yeah. So when that happened, I was I was very confused in the sense. Uh, you know, should I back off? Should I go? You know, because I know the radiation is harmful. Yeah, uh, it kills you because uh, if you if you are contracted with radiation, three things can happen to you. Uh, you know, most like most people suffer from thyroid cancer, leukemia, uh, yeah. and for females, it's more like breast cancer. Yeah. So um, but at that time, all I knew was like, okay, radiation it will shut down your system if you you know too much of it. Uh, but of course, I didn't know how much was it, and I didn't even have a, uh, my Geiger counter with me. Right. Yeah. So that that was the only thing I was afraid of. Okay. Um, but but when I went to the um, uh, tsunami area, there's no radiation there. So the things that uh, many people got a bit confused, yeah. thinking that you know, uh, Japan tsunami is like the whole place is is is. Uh, radiation you know, when he when it happened I, I still remember clearly that uh, many of my friends uh, you know from overseas they, they they refused to go to Japan even like to go to Tokyo they say oh no no we're not going to Tokyo yeah, because yeah, it's right. so high you know um, but you know Tokyo to Fukushima is miles away you know so so um, so again it's understanding it um, so due to that, a lot of businesses were affected. People just didn't want to go. Um, but I did more research on that. Yeah. So when I went to uh, these places in in Ishinomaki, so like Ishinomaki, Naturi, you know, is is uh, there, there are no radiation there. Okay. So the difference with with tsunami and earthquake that that took place. And the Fukushima power plant, the explosion of it, uh, <coughs> the impression that Fukushima was also affected by the tsunami houses were destroyed. Uh, it's not true. Uh, when the power plant exploded, exploded um, 
it's like 30 kilometers radius. Yeah. So those were inland. Those people were staying within at 30 kilometers. They had to evacuate because the radiation level was too high. Mm. So, so there are places that became ghost towns. So it's like, you, you know, you're walking there, it's like, you know, lights on no one's home. Right. Yeah. So, um, so when I saw this, you know, um, going into a disaster area again, uh, I think I've said this before, uh, pe people always say, wow, you know, I can get nice pictures. You know, it's not about nice, making nice pictures. Mm. It's about getting the story out, getting, getting to let the world know what's happening. Yeah. Uh, Did you already kind of know what you wanted to? No, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. Every assignment I go, I don't know what to expect. I, I've been brief what to do, what, you know, uh, what's going on. But when you get there, it's a totally different scenario. Mm -hmm. It's like you go there and it's like, you know, uh, what you've been told doesn't even exist. So when I went in, the, in this place, was the, the, the devastation was so huge yeah. that um, I just don't know where to start. Right. Uh, because, you know, um, to make a strong, strong, compelling picture, yeah. to get the message across, you need to, to have a right composition, not just take the whole shot of it. So, um, again, uh, what caught my eye was, um, of course, that building was still standing in the background yeah. and of all the window frames on the foreground. So, I just want, I want to show the, the depth of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this was shot up in the air. Yeah. So, um, so, we flew around. This was taken in Sendai, in the um, in the car uh, industrial area. All the Toyotas, uh, new cars, they were going ready for transportation for oh. overseas. But these are all the trucks. But uh, when I saw this, you know, it's just um, it's just unbelievable to my eyes because the trucks are huge. You know, yeah. they they were stacked you know, on top of each other. So it just reminded me like like Lego, you know, it was like you know, like a Lego thing, you know, it's like it's unreal. So uh, you know, you have to be there to see it. And then 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 you sort of really, you know, you, you just be, you know, filled with um, lots of emotions, you know. But um, but nature can do. Yeah. So so this is just a closer shot. And so you were just walking around, or. How, yes, um, disasters area usually, most likely, usually, all the time actually, most of the time you have to walk because um, you can only go by public trans transport to a certain uh, uh, distance, yeah. by most, most of the roads uh, badly destroyed. Okay. So, so there's no way you can go by road. So you can go by road, and you go to, you know, the furthest you could, then you start walking. So I uh, did a lot of walking. I walk uh, a day uh, easily about you know ten to fifteen hours. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Just to give you the um, the impact of um, the tsunami, white end, and all the debris and and mud and soil got into this car. So everything was destroyed. Uh, this was in uh, Naturi. So when I went there, I was pretty late. I was up there, but almost like six o'clock. And um, there was nobody there. So because I, I walked, so I ended up there pretty late. So when I saw all the footprints, as you can see, all the footprints from here. Yeah. So these were all the... Uh, rescue workers and, and uh, they were clean and also cleaning up debris. Okay. They walk as well. So, but you know, um, they stop, they, you know, when it's about to get dark. So, I, yes, sorry. I mean, as you're walking around, you know, what about your food and 
and then your account and all that. And are there like police roadblocks around uh, the area? Okay, the, the police roadblocks, um, roadblocks going to Fukushima, uh, the Aichi power plant. So they will, when I was there during the, the first incident, roadblock, I was like 30, 20 kilometers. Okay. So within 20 kilometers, you, they, 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 they have a roadblock going into Fukushima. Uh, other than that, there was no roadblock. Um, I mean, the police themselves, they were so busy with, you know, uh, with mon managing the, the public. Yeah. So I, I think they didn't have time even to, to look at, you know, stopping people, you know, because uh, in Japan is one country that I've been mm. uh, on a disaster. I think Japan is the only country in the world I have, I've seen there was no looting. Wow. And in other countries, when there's a when there's a, a disaster, you yeah. you see lots of looting, people going in to steal. But yeah. in Japan, no, nah, no. Nah. So uh, it's is fantastic. So again, um, how I get to Naturi? I um, I walk and. I didn't have a vehicle because uh, there was. You can even if you have a vehicle, you can hardly get it. You can hardly get petrol. Okay. So most petrol kiosks uh, are they either closed or they totally run out of petrol. Okay. So what I did, um, I um, I walked in and I end up in, in this bridge. I saw a lady. She was in a car, and I um, I asked her whether you know. Uh, she could take me to uh, to this place. Uh, she didn't speak English. Her name is Teiko. Okay. Um, so she lost her house. You know, she lost everything. But the only thing she had was only a car. And um, kind enough, she she took me. We we I don't speak Japanese. She doesn't speak English. But somehow or other, I just told her not to read. You know, and and she said, oh, okay, you know. And a bit of sign language. Yeah. And um, when she put she had a small car and, and, and she opened up on the passenger side, she was clearing her clearing the seat. Yeah. I was wondering what, what she was doing, but then I realized she was actually collecting a lot of um, you know, in a in a disaster, you know, like the shops, you know, all the canned food, drinks. Yeah. yeah. She was actually collecting all those for survival. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that really you know, uh, I felt really touched by it. That, wow, you know, this, you know, in the surviving mode, you do everything and anything. Yeah. And yet, she's still so kind. She, she took me there. Yeah. Um, I gave her my card, but I didn't take a picture of it at that time. So, uh, when she, when she got me to the, the, to the destination, and before I could even say thank you, uh, she left. So I uh, I lost touch with her, yeah. but I'll I'll go on and tell you about the story behind between Keiko and myself. We have we have a a, a, a bonding after okay. what has happened. I think someone asked uh, like your food and stuff. Yeah, Lee is asking whether you know do I have a local contact fixer, and how do I get food and accommodation? Um, when I first went there. I had a fixer. When I said fixer, I didn't plan. I just went in. Uh, I knew no one. Uh, going into the to the area and look for fixer. Mm. Yeah. So uh, so I I didn't have uh, a plan fixer. So I just went asking around. Okay. And uh, of course, I met many many uh, many great people that helped me. Yeah. Uh, one of one of the guys that helped me a couple of times. Uh, uh, his name is Kyrie, so he he helped me uh, uh, quite a fair bit. Mm. And once, and I've been to Japan about nine times on and off. So till I got to know the place better, then I I went on my own. Yeah. In terms of food, um, I stack up um, peanuts. And um, green tea without sugar. Yeah. Uh, initially, you know, when I first 
when they, I, I had like energy drain, you know, um, but then I realized it was a big mistake because um, when you get thirsty, you drink those en energy drink. Yeah. You go even more thirsty because it's sweet sugar, so it's sticky. Mm. And I survived from peanuts, uh, Japanese uh, peanuts and rice crackers that will fill you up. And uh, green tea, you, you go through without sugar. You know, I go for the strongest green tea because when you drink, it just goes on your throat. It gets, you know, it gets, um, you get a nice layer of feeling, you know, it's a bit um, uh, bitter. Yeah. So, it, so my throat doesn't get dry. It doesn't get it dry. So that's what I did. Um, I work with a short lens. So I don't really work with uh, long lenses. So, so which means that I have to go uh, as close as what um, the rescuers and the army uh, clearing all the debris. Okay. You have a so, specific lens that you use or a specific body? Uh, yes, my work lens is uh, it's a 35 millimeter lens. That's my work lens. Okay. Uh, my body, I use a uh, Leica M. I use an M system. Um, because the M system, they're pretty robust and and the, the, the easy to move around, they're easy to carry around. Uh, you don't even have to carry a bag, you know. So you can even, you know, you have a pouch. Your pouch is big enough, you can put your camera inside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of things, uh, cases like that, um, I, I will minimize uh, to carry uh, too much. Because if it gets too much, it weighs you down. You, you know, you get tired, you get, it gets pretty heavy. So yeah. it'd be hard to move around. So the thing is, is the, the whole whole idea is you have to be mobile, uh, travel light. So you know, so in, in terms to to gain as as con conserve as much energy as you can. Yeah, yeah. This photo, um, when I took this shot, um, after I took this photo, I met the owner on the house on the right. So I asked the owner, it's like, oh, is this your neighbor's house? You know, uh, is he around or, or the family around? And uh, the man told me that that house doesn't belong to that area. So mm -hmm. what happened, what actually happened, the tsunami sort of pushed the house in to, the, to this particular area. Wow. So, uh, so, so sometimes, you know, we all think that, oh, okay, it's just a house next door, but it's not, it's, it's, it's like about one kilometer away from Pushkin. Uh, this photo, when I was um, walking, I did a lot of walking, but it looks, it looks quite simple, but uh, I tell you it's not because, um, I had to walk from roof to roof. So when the tsunami happened, all the houses were stacked. So the road was, was totally sort of lifted up, filled by houses. Okay. So in order to, to, to get to where you want to walk, you have to climb, and then you walk from, from, the, from, the, from the rooftop. So okay. these people, they were going into their house, or their houses, the families, they were, they were trying to salvage whatever they could. So I, I had to walk from roof to roof as well. Yeah, so for you, it must have been physically demanding to... Yes, it is. Things. Yeah, it is uh, it's physically demanding, uh, tiring, and uh, the thing is that you got to watch your steps because there are a lot of debris. Yeah. Debris, a lot of nails, uh, metal rods were sticking out, uh, you know, broken boots, and so, so you... And, and, and bricks, you know. So you just have to be very careful within your steps. Yeah. So the, the, the things that when, when doing such a, an assignment, uh, of course, is not to get, not to be injured and don't fall sick. Because once you're sick or, or say if you've got a cut or whatever, it's very discomfort, yeah. very uncomfortable to, to work, you know. So I always try to, in fact, I always keep myself uh, safe in that sense. Yeah. This was taken in um, Casanoma. Um, this is a fishing vessel. After six months, I went, I went in 
uh, I went back to Japan. Um, and as you can see, the power pole here, after six months, the uh, Japanese um, government, they rebuilt the reconstruction of uh, whatever is necessary. Okay. And this ship, this fishing boat, fishing vessel, was pulled in at about five kilometers in. Yeah. And as you can see, to me, the photo, uh, this photo is, is, is all about, not just about the, the fishing vessel. Uh, to me, it's about life. Mm. Uh, like this, this man here is the postman. His uh, postman was doing, still doing his deliveries. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, there are houses here. Yeah. And houses behind also. So, you know, so the waves came in up to a certain distance and it, it just died down. Yeah. The tsunami came in. And so the, the delivery of letters was still going on. So, yeah. you know, so what caught my eye was the motorbike, you know, the postman was riding past the, on this big uh, abandoned uh, fishing vessel that, um, you know, so that caught my eye. And to me, I wanted to show um, life goes on. Mm. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from um, Michael. Yeah. When, you know, do you shoot first? Uh, he's, he has a question on approach. So, do you shoot first and then only approach and talk? Or okay, I um, I work through body language and eye contact. So, what I tend to do, I shoot first, then I talk. I ask questions because the minute I start talking, I lose that moment. For instance, like like this photo, see the man just lying down, and yeah. you know, and the ladies, uh, I think she's on the phone, and uh, the other lady on the left, um, you know, she's she's folding a piece of paper. I think they're doing um, Sorry, yeah. Japanese. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, um, so the minute if I start talking, I lose that moment. I lose that. That moment of the way they the way they are. So I I don't talk first. I take a picture first, and of course, but I read through body language and eye contact. So in order to do that, you know, uh, to get permission access. So sometimes I knock, knock, or uh, I do eye eye gesture. So I bring out my camera. If uh, there's there's no indication of saying no then uh, I take it as a yes that uh, they allow me to take a photo. So I, I take a photo uh, first, then I ask questions. Mm. So like this photo, um, this was how I came up, end up doing a book on, on Japan. On my first trip I went, um, I saw People in a surviving mode. For them, is survival mm. number one. They lost everything, and to them, is survival. And they had a lot of volunteers coming in from all over the world. Even people from all over Japan uh, came to help. So they felt a lot of um, presence of uh, support. And second time I went, you know, there's still lots of people helping. Mm. But I saw the, the, the different reaction from, from the survivors. You know, I could see they sort of look back and, 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 it, and for them is, this is not sh short term uh, fix. This yeah. is long term. Yeah. You know? So, so when, when it's long term, then this when they start to, they start to ponder and think, yeah, you know, what am I going to do? What's, what's my future is going to be like yeah. and so on and so on. And, um, so the th third trip, you know, I mean, I came back, I, I approached the, um, agency that assigned me to do the work. I, um, I said, look, you know, um, going back, I want to do more work. And of course, I was told by a few publications that now, you know, Japan is okay now. Um, you know, um, we've covered the mainstream 
but I saw deeper than that. You know? So I saw that people, were, the aftermath was really hitting them really bad. So I decided to do a book on that. So that's when I kept going back. Okay. And each time you go back, I mean, the story is different, right? Yeah, every time, yeah, every time you go back, you, uh, you know, you see different things. And, 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 and the longer it is, the time stretch yeah. after the, the mishap of the of the March 11 say after like two years you see less and less people coming yeah so that's when I saw even a bigger picture I saw mm. a bigger bigger picture of uh, you know like me I don't even know them I just go to to their homes yeah uh, you know they live in the container houses and just by visiting them uh, they, I could see, you know, they, they felt so, so, so appreciative mm. because it came to a point that initially they had lots of people and then it sort of died down yeah. because, you know, people think, oh, Japan is okay, you know, so it died down less and less people. So, um, uh, so they felt, felt lost in that sense. So, mm. you know, just being there, your presence, not even speaking a word, it means a lot to them. Yeah. So that's when I, I, I look at it, I, it's like, yes, this has got to be done. I need to do the book. I want to get this out. Mm. And this is in the, um, in the community center. So what they, they did, as you can see, all the uh, boxes here. Yeah. So this is like their part, their sort of area of their belongings. So okay. the box is like a boundary line of you know this okay. line where they live, where they stay for yeah. a time being. While the authorities were they were building um, our containers. How long were they living like this? Um, I think it was about six months. Okay. I I'm not very sure because the, the after. After a year, I went back. They had containers already. Okay. So they built containers. They were pretty fast. Uh, they built, but uh, when I went to this area at that time, this was just it happened. This was in April. Yeah. So it took quite a while, uh, you know, to get things organized. But uh, overall, um, the rebuilding of uh, you know temporary homes was done very quick. Mm. We have a question from Willie. So yes. for disasters like these, would you prefer to shoot in color or in black and white? Um, preferably, I prefer color uh, because uh, I, when I started photography, I shot black and white. You know, I was shooting for black and white for 15 years for all the publications. I find color is, uh, is a challenge because black and white, black and white is strong, it's dramatic. Yeah, uh, it's timeless, um, but in things like that, uh, color it shows the the variations of um, you know of what's going on, you know, mm. and and you can even tell the time of the era of color, and you know, in certain certain era, people dress differently in terms of fashion wise and whatnot. You know, so I find color is, is much, much more challenging because uh, if I shot color and my background is so colorful, my subject matter um, doesn't stand out, then people, someone might say, hey, that's a nice colorful picture. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't get my message across. So I find color is, is more challenging for me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I just want to show the whole true color of the surrounding. Yeah. Uh, I like black and white. But I think for documentation for this, I, I prefer to do color. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. And for this photo, this was uh, taken in, this is in Ishinamaki or Naturi. I, you know, I can so many places I can remember. I'm trying to recall. Uh, I think this was taken in Ishinamaki. Um, so, 
sometimes when you take photos, you know, I know a lot of people, they follow camera rules. For me, I don't follow the rules. I, I follow the rules, I break the rules. Yeah. So that's the only way to, to build your own style on your, or, or your own way of interpretation or your own way of thinking. Yeah. So what really caught my eye, there were, there were three buildings. Okay. There were only three buildings standing. The rest was totally damaged. So this building in front, and then it's a building behind her. That's yeah. where she lived. She was with the father. And um, so they live on the first level. Second level was not too bad. You know, uh, wasn't that bad because the water went right up, right, right up to this level. Okay, wow. Okay. So those who live in, below, everything was damaged by water. So because the building was still standing, a lot of things were still intact. Right. So when she went back, you know, uh, um, what touch, touch me, touches me, um, she was going through her staff dolls. She was okay. trying to savage her staff doll. And yeah. As a teenager, you know, I mean, she was like, you know, 13, 14 years old. You know, and, uh, and then she was just sitting down and with her eyes, because the eye says a lot in a, in a human mm. uh, human communication. Your eyes is the strongest communication. Mm. So eyes doesn't lie. So, you know, and uh, I just want to show a bit of it to show that, that, that impact on it. So, yeah. so that's why I took a photo of that. So these are all the new cars in, in, uh, in Senda oh, wow. that, you know, they transported. Uh, I see. Yeah. So everything was totally damaged. Now this is um. There's a story behind it. Um, they are now husband and wife. When I met them, you know, they they were a couple. Mm. And uh, I met his. I met her father. Her father is um, Kensan. Um, her father was a taxi driver. Okay. So when I first met him, you know, he told me that uh, before tsunami, tsunami has changed his life and it's changed his, his way of looking at things as well. Uh, totally, you know. Uh, so before that, he was, um, he didn't, he only cared for himself. Okay. You know, so he just did his daily living and, and whatever happens to, whatever happens going on around, it, it doesn't really affect him. Mm. But when tsunami happened, uh, he was not in his home. He was out driving his taxi. Mm. And that's his daughter. Okay. And that uh, was a boyfriend, now his husband. Um, they were in the home. And... And tsunami came in. She was uh, she was on the ground floor. He was on uh, le on the next level, level one, yeah, on the upper upper floor. So she was caught in in the wave. Okay. And he went down and pulled her out from it. So he is safe alive, and and what really saved them is the boat behind them. So you know that boat was come was. The waves was coming in, and they were sharing with me that what they did, they jumped into that boat, and the boat just went in inland. Okay. Yeah. So, and that boat was there uh, on this this inland was not was not removed for good, I think, six months. Okay. So that's that's when I got a shot of it. You know, they sort of brought me to the side and said, "This is the boat." They they, they jump into it. that saved them. Yeah. So because of that, you know, um, you know, Kensan has became so grateful that, you know, uh, his, his daughter's life has been saved by now her, her husband. And when, when he, he met me and, and he was very, very giving, you know, he was helping. And, and, and I, I asked a question. I said, you know, I said, thank you very much. You're very helpful. You even invite me to your house. You know, you, 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 
you invite me to meet your family uh, yeah. and he even did meals you know and um and he said yes it's his duty now to to help any stranger that comes into his country and mm. wanting to do to do stories and get it get the get the world known what's happening and uh, after what has happened to him he see lives in a different way yeah so uh, so you know so tsunami has, has, has changed people's views and life in many form many sense mm. this must be a very special photo to them i mean it's like the boat that actually saved their life. Yes, you know, but uh, uh, I didn't show it to them, you know, because when I took a photo, I, um, you know, uh, I didn't, I didn't show it to them. So I've not been what back to Japan since 2015. So I would like to go back. Okay. Hmm. Were you alone um, for most of these? Okay, I was alone, and I was with. Uh, few of my Japanese friends, you know, okay. like one of it is uh, Kairi who was with me and then um, and a few, uh, my most of the time also my own. Okay. Yeah. And this was taken in 2011. Uh, same story again, you know, I, I thought, you know, I, I just came to my mind, oh, this one must be somebody's house uh, beside the State of Liberty. You know? um, and then I was told that now nah, it belongs to someone else, you know, the house has been pulled in. And, and just happened that, what coincidence that uh, someone saw the picture and said, this, that's his friend's house. Wow. And after a year, I went back. Uh, that's how it looked like it cleared the place. Completely different. Yes, completely different, yeah. Mm -hmm. This was in, uh, in, sorry, in February, in winter. These are all the um, nuclear waste. When I say nuclear waste, con sorry, contaminated uh, waste. When I say contaminated, the grass. Um, so when, when, in the, when Fukushima Daiichi power plant exploded, um, it was filled with uh, radiation. So what they had to do, they had to they had to clear, uh, literally decontaminate the grass. They had to dig out, and then they had to scrub buildings. And this. In one of the homes I went, uh, totally damaged, but um, they were. She was just trying to salvage, trying to save whatever she could. So she was um, picking up, you know, pills, cups, plates. Do they do they go back often to try to sell, salvage oh. whatever they can? Every time when I was there, I meet people and I ask them. Sometimes they, they will, you know, once a week or once a month. So all various and others who do not wish to go back at all. There's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, memories. So, so they, especially they're afraid to, to go to the sea. Mm. For this photo, I was caught in a sandstorm. So, um, Japan disaster is is not you know um, not just tsunami earthquake. I mean, this was after the aftermath um, sandstorm as well. You yeah. know, but it's not reported. Uh, I was there on my own, and I was uh, walking and. I saw the sandstorm coming in. So, yeah, I was the only person. I took the picture, and, and as the minute the, the, the wind came in, or rather the sandstorm, yeah. uh, I initially had to run uh, because, you know, the wind, I don't know, you know, from I think it was perhaps maybe going for about 
60, 70 kilometers an hour mm-hmm. per wind speed, uh, or even faster. Because uh, if I don't run, I get pushed. So what I did, I, I, I went in the same direction as the wind was blowing. Because okay. so I did that, the wind actually took me off. Wow. So yeah. I was flying for that few seconds in mid-air. Yeah, it took me off and I had to sort of paddle my leg like as though I'm cycling in mid-air and try to get, when I reach ground, I try to get hold of ground and keep running to get the momentum so that I will not fall. Yeah. And I was trying to run for cover behind the building or behind the tree. Yeah. That's what I did. Yeah. So, um, Oh, it must I, have been an experience. Uh, it was, it was, it was frightening. Yeah. Uh, not knowing what to expect. Um, you know, but, uh, again, I, I, I was there. I was the only one there. Uh, but uh, things like that that happen that, that you just have to learn to survive, you know, and, and make sure that uh, uh, you've got to think fast. Yeah. yeah. Just when I took this picture, yeah, I didn't have time to think at all. You know, I saw, I saw the sandstorm sand coming in. Uh, uh, so, you know, I didn't have time to think how am I going to compose or, you know, you got no time to think at all, nothing whatsoever. And of course, as you can see, I uh, see this this line here. That's yeah. actually my hair. Okay. So the wind was blowing. My hair was all over the place. Yeah. You know? wow. So uh, then I, when I came back, I downloaded. And I was like, you know, what is that? Is that you know? Uh, I was like, how can it be? You know, there's 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 no no nothing between me. You know. Yeah. Then I realized it was my hair that was flying all over the place. And a friend of mine told me, oh, why didn't you just touch it up? You know. So. I don't believe in doing Photoshop, so I leave it as it is, the way it was recorded. Okay. So I, at that moment, as it is. Yeah, there was a question actually, if you do um, post-processing to your photos. No, I don't. The only post-process, okay, um, I don't know whether it's called it post-process or not, I do um, my levels. So those who, who did dark room in the early days, they would understand that uh, when you start printing in, in the dark room, although your negative is correct exposure, and, but you need, when you print on your enlarger, you expose, you need to get a correct exposure from the enlarger to get the correct color print. And mm-hmm. then because of that, you need to burn and dodge. Yeah, you need to contrast. You need to, to, to do your, your contrast on your exposure. So the only thing that I did I just do fine tuning because no matter what, because I shoot DNG raw mm. and you still have to do a bit of fine tuning. So my, my fine tuning is levels. Okay. About it. I don't even do uh, dodge and burn. So that's what I do. This one, this man, he, uh, as you can see the reflection of the, the glass, that's his home. So he, he, he went back and, and took whatever he could and put in his car and um, was driving back to the, the home that he was given, a temporary home, the uh, container homes. Mm. So that's what he was doing. So very, very rarely you find people in a, in a disaster area, uh, unless of course their, their homes are still intact. So that was a lady, this is another home, uh, just not far away from the previous shot. So this is what, they, what she did. She collected bowls and uh, utensils. This photo, um, oh, I don't know why people like taking photos because you know it means a lot. Photo is times of your life. Mm. Uh, Sometimes we don't realize, you know, like in Japan, um, many of them lost their homes, uh, lost their, uh, actually, practically everything. But photos to them, it meant a lot. Yeah. When I say a lot, it's like the photos coming down from the generation. Okay. It's times of your life. You know, so once the photo is lost, 
you know you cannot you cannot see physically yeah. in memory yeah so what this lady did the lady she was a school teacher i never met i never got to meet her okay she started this project she went around picking up all the photos that was buried and under the debris and it was filled with mud and it was really dirty and she restored them she started washing them and and, and you know wash them and hang them and stack them and they, you know they found a lot of photo albums and came came to a point where by this like a community center yeah people just go there and look for for their photos and then if they find it they, they take it back wow so because it means a lot to them because a lot of them uh it's just not a photo it means a lot to them because the photo it goes down from generation after it could be from third generation fourth generation mm. so it means a lot so now i now i see a deeper deeper level as well you know why people you know so many people love taking photos yeah, yeah. so photo is a very powerful tool and now people don't really Oh, it's all digital versions. Yeah, not all digital. Yeah, yeah, but nothing is a hard copy print. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this was in the um, extrusion zone, whereby uh, this is going in. You know, they had a restriction of uh, twenty kilometers radius before you could go into Fukushima. So uh, when I was there, when it happened, uh, I was told that. Um, the workers could only work for about 20 minutes in a power plant okay. and then they have to, they have to um, shift, they have to change staff, change workers. And as, as time progresses, you know, they started working one hour, two hours, then it changed. Because the radiation was too, levels too high. Mm. We have a question from Terry. So it was regarding the previous slide on the hanging photos he noticed that the resolution was not exactly sharp and he was wondering if you purposely did it that way no um of course the, the, the resolution will not be sharp because if you look at it the photo the photo itself is not sharp the photograph yeah if you, you know what i mean yeah. so if the photograph see like for instance like this photo yeah this photo is not sharp because in the early days, you know, they, they were shot, you know, I don't know what camera it is, but you know, it must have used just a normal lab, normal, normal printing, normal paper. So that's not sharp. So, and uh, of course, I, I cannot get a sharp image. So I shot as the way it is, you know, and in fact, this was a sharp point I focused on here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that as well, if you look at that. So it was not done on purpose, it's shot the way it is. So I, I will not manipulate, I will not do sharpening. So many of me, as far as I know, a lot of them say, oh, you know, I want sharper image, I will sharpen my photo. But again, if you sharpen your photo, you're not sharpening your picture because the picture is really not sharp. Yeah. So if you're sharpening, you know, then you, you're making your pixels, make it tighter. So, you know, so your picture will not look sharp at all. It just looks, pixel, it's pixels, it's tighter. So mm. no, I didn't manipulate. So it was not done on purpose, it's shot the way it was. And also, um, lighting was quite bad. I don't use a flash, so I'm not perfect. You know, uh, it could be also maybe my focusing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So yes. Okay. Okay. So I was going back to this. Yeah, they will. Um, this was organized or rather man managed by uh, Techco. Tepco is uh, the Tokyo Electric Company. Mm. They supply the, they run the power plant. Okay. So, um, so before you go into to Fukushima, they will, you know, do a scan on you. And these are the workers that are going into the power plant. They go in a bus. And so you also dressed, um, you know, with protective gear? Certain areas, yes. Certain areas, no. Okay. So all depends, you know. Uh, sometimes areas I went in, um, uh, supposed to, but I wasn't aware of it. 
So I just have a mask, I, my bandana is brown, and I have this, this one. Right. So, so this would this would tell me, because mm -hmm. if 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 the um, reading is too high, you can see it's blinking. Okay. If the reading is too high, it starts to beep. Right. Yeah. So when it starts to beep, once it reaches to one point zero microsiever, uh, it will beep. It, as the number goes higher, it beeps faster. Okay. So it's telling you that you know you are in the danger zone. Yeah, yeah. So mine's a very basic one. You know, they've got really big ones, really, you know, uh, more advanced. Mm. So um, so mine's a very basic. So it reaches a certain level, it will beep. It goes beep, 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 beep. You know, until yeah. it gets too high, it doesn't beep anymore. It just go. Brrr. <laughs> like that, so which means I know my system. Uh, yeah, so much you can take. Um, again, in the bus, yeah, these guys uh, they were coming in. Those guys were going out. This is Deco that you that took me uh, in uh, that she drove me. So mm -hmm. that's a home. Um, in Yamamoto. Okay. And uh, she she took me there and she showed me a place. She lived very near to the beach, only like walking distance, like only about about seven hundred seven hundred meters away. You know, it's just walking distance. Um, and so when I met her, I. I gave her my card when I first met her. Yeah. That's how I got in touch with her, you know. Um, and she gave me a number. And I, um, when I came back several times, I contacted her. Yeah. Uh, through a Japanese friend, because uh, she can't speak English, I can't speak Japanese. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to call and then talk, you know, because so I got a friend to help me to interpret. So the minute she, the moment she knows I'm in town, um, we'll meet up for a meal. That's and nice. Yes, yeah. And then she, she will, um, she saw my card and she, she, she saw my website, she saw my photos, she saw like, an idea what I did. Yeah. And I told her, after one year, I'm going to have an exhibition. Yeah. The first anniversary of the tsunami. Mm. And she told me that, she will come. She will wow. come. You know, and um, so I had it in Singapore at a Cathay Gallery, and she came. She came. She only spent uh, two days in Singapore. She arrived the day, and then she attended the exhibition. The next yeah. day she flew off. Wow. So uh, um, I'm just going to show you a video. Okay. Uh, she, when she came to Singapore, she had an interview with uh, the media here. Okay. With, uh, Channel News Asia. Okay, so this is Teiko. 58 year old Teiko Mito from Miyagi Prefecture is one of the victims. <laughs> All Teiko had left was her car, which she lived in for a month. It was when she was driving in Sendai that she crossed paths with photojournalist Matthias Hing, who wanted to hitch a ride to Natori. Teiko flew in for the weekend to lend support for his photo exhibition. Matthias was recording the aftermath of the disaster, but he felt so moved by the unshakable spirit of the Japanese people that he revisited the country three more times. From what I've uh, experienced from the survivors, uh, just, just being there with them uh, is already, it means a lot to them because they feel that they've not been supported. So that's, that's the reason uh, why I felt that, uh, you know, it's very important uh, to show, to bring the story out. Matthias's photo exhibition will run until 14 April.
So, so coming back to this exhibition, when I did this, I learned another perspective of value of life. Mm. Uh, Tiko lost everything. And um, she flew in and uh, I got sponsors to, to fly her in. She refused to, uh, to even accept the money. She said, no, she's coming at her own. Um, and I took her out for meal. We went have meals and um, we had uh, we had drinks. We had tiger beer. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, you know, of course, you know, food. And when everything was over, I was like, I was going to throw the the, the can and the bottle. Yeah. And she said, no, she wants it. I cannot figure it out. And she said, um, she wants to keep this as memory that she came to Singapore for, for the exhibition and she's got nothing and this is a new collection. Mm. That really touched me because it's just a bottle of, uh, you know, beer bottle and a can. Yeah. And, and to her, it means a lot. But for us, sometimes we just take it for granted, we, uh, we trade away. But for her, it means so much. Yeah. So that's one thing I learned about, not just as a photographer, but also about life, you know? Mm. So photography, you know, it brings in so, so many messages. Yeah. So it depends on how we look at it. Yeah. So, you know, uh, after six months later, I went back, I, I went to a, to a, container home mm -hmm. and she started showing me and it's like this is the the beer we had together yeah. so uh it's just amazing yeah and this photo um this is the uh, quarantine area so after you go to the power plant uh you need to decontaminate okay. to wash up so uh then you gotta take your shoes off you go in to, and that's how it looks like. And that as well, you got to clean your boots as you walk in. Uh, this is one of the container homes. Uh, these are not tsunami victims. These are nuclear victims. So they live in uh, containers as well. Um, their homes are still intact. Um, but they can't go back. Uh, you know, I met uh, a Japanese man with his wife and his daughter. He misses his home because his home is uh, four generation. But his wife and his, his daughter didn't want to go back because of the radiation. Okay. Over there, even these are all the debris that was buried after one and a half years. And um, due to the heat, caused fire. Wow. So, you know, th things like that as well. You think that, oh, okay, it's just debris, nothing's going to happen. But due to the heat, uh, and that's when fire starts. That's one of the memorial ground. Were there lots of these, um, you know, all over the place? Just uh, this one? Yeah. Yes, there are a few, a few. I wouldn't say many, but uh, I would say five to six of it, on, you know, on different places. Yeah. Uh, this is the railroad track that was uh, destroyed by uh, tsunami. So they were rebuilding it. Okay. And as time goes by, uh, after one and a half years, the fishing industry slowly picking up. So uh, this was in Casanoma. 
But I mean, were people still wary about the food coming from that area? Um, not in Kesonoma, because Kesonoma they're no no um, radioactive. In Fukushima, yes, because in Fukushima, by uh, in uh, Minamitsuma, mm. it's about fifteen kilometers from uh, Fukushima, or 20, 20 kilometers. Yes, out there, um, the for instance, the rice when you buy a rice is they have a a stem, okay. saying that is is safe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when I was in uh, Fukushima at that time. Uh, I had to eat. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So for me, it's um, I I I, I was I had no choice. Just eat less. Uh, this is in the school. So the school has been um, many children lost their school, so they relocate them. And then then this um, this is a very Japanese way. Before before meal, they put their hands together as as uh, a sign of um, gesture of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Were there many children um, in the area? Yes. Okay. And these are kids, you know. They again, uh, as I was saying, that uh, they when they see a uh, a visitor, yeah, they're so happy. Because you know, children that have no toys when when the disaster happened, mm. they lost almost everything. Yeah. So for them is, when someone comes, uh, they feel very happy, they're very delighted. This is in Ishinomaki. Shops are slowly opening up. Uh, so you know, so this is this is a shop where by the they sell almost everything. You know. As you can see, the background, uh, sewing threads, flowers, and they, they have a book as well, like a little uh, small library. Ooh. And just to sh- give you an idea as well, you know, I mean, life goes on, you know, it's just not disaster and sadness. Yeah. Uh, you know, people rebuild their life. So this was in, in a pub. This is in the uh, container homes. So uh, this was done by a, um, a fa- quite a famous artist. Okay. I think from from Brazil. Okay. Yeah. Many places are still um, not clear yet. Mm. So what the Japanese government did, they clear the main areas first and then places that no longer can be used they, you know they don't they will give priority to, to more of the more of the main infrastructure areas um, that's the barber shop okay so again um, this was a ghost town actually so um, but every now and then you get people coming in so I met uh, uh, Una. He came in, and most of the time he hardly gets anyone coming in for a haircut because there's nobody there. But it just happened that that day someone happened to be there. So he say, you know, he lives in a con- in a container home, but he he was saying that he rather work although there's nothing, there's no one there, but he rather be in, in his shop. Hmm. This is in Ishanamaki. Okay. This is in the town. So this, this town was affected as well. It was still intact, but it, the water came in. Right. Do you have any rules for your composition? I mean, when you are taking... Uh, no, I, 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 I don't follow rules. I, 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 uh, when I say I don't follow rules, I stick by the rules, but I break the rules. Yeah. That's the only way you can learn. That's the only way you can start to build your own style of shooting. Because the, the, the more the more you if you follow rules, then every photo is gonna look the same. Then your photo you never improve because because you're always doing the same thing. Mm. You know, very uh, becomes very monotonous. Yeah. So so in arts, yeah, in creativity, 
although yes they have certain rules yeah but build your own style yeah once you start to shoot your own rules shoot your own style eventually uh, you know what to do in when I say you know what to do your angles mm. just like this you know uh, I the children and the dog just happened to walk in in my frame you know so I found that it's quite interesting yeah so take a shot of it so again my main focal point uh, are the girls yeah and the dog is uh, part of my subject my element same here um, so things a lot of organization were, were trying to to lift the spirit of the people mm. so they had games you know so they had this this loop so whoever throws the loop and goes in to this guy yeah they get that price <laughs> okay it's a scooter yeah. is it a scooter, yeah yeah mm -hmm. And no charge, you know, so every, anyone could play. Okay. Okay, so I went through that just now. Uh, this is, um, that's how they live in the container. Mm. Just give, in, give my audience an idea. That's in a school. So schools were also makeshift. Makeshift, yep, a few of it, uh, especially those who are affected in, in Ishinamaki. Like, uh, I had a, I knew someone. Um, he's a Singaporean, actually, okay. uh, who works in Japan as a teacher. Okay. And um, when I met him, uh, he told me that when he got posted to Ishinamaki before tsunami, he turned the, the offer down. He didn't want to go to Ishinamaki. So uh, another teacher, another teacher replaced him. Yeah. His post. And then tsunami happened. Um, unfortunately, the teacher didn't survive. So that he got affected very badly. Mm -hmm. So um, after a year, after a year. You know, he was playing on his mind. He decided to go back, or rather, he decided to go to Ishinamaki and teach the students. So he spent two years there. Uh, but from from his from his sharing, he told me that it was depressing for him. Yeah. So uh, eventually, he he asked for a post posting. This train was contamin contaminated with uh, radiation. Okay. So no longer in use at a point of time mm. when I was there. So this is um, about 15 kilometers from Fukushima power plant. This is one of the hospitals. Uh, this is um, one of the uh, MRI machine. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the hospital, this was quite, I think it was the second level. Okay. So the tsunami came in and as you can see all the debris are so yeah. no longer in use uh, like that. Yeah, everything was abandoned. Ooh. This was one of the train stations. It, as you can see, the grass is quite long, so uh, the, because this is one of the contaminated areas. So again, uh, this is my my only indicator that right. tells me. Yeah. So I've been to quite a number of places. You know, it beeps quite quite high. Uh, my ring is quite high. Yeah. So um, um, I just got to be careful and and either. I back off or, or I, go, I move on. Yeah, it all depends on, on, on the case by case. Mm. So again, this, uh, this, this guy is doing uh, inspection of um, uh, radiation reading. So um, after two years, um, see when, it, when the power plant exploded, 
the radiations in the air, everything is the, the reading was was high. Yeah. But after two years, what happens? Uh, if you, you happen to put your your meter, whatever me, Geiger counter meter, say sort of your your height level, mm. everything might be low after one year or two years. Okay. But if you do your reading below, right at the corner, below below ground ground level, yeah. or near the the drainage or or plants, whatever, that's when the reading is very high oh. because the radiation subsides. Right, goes down. So again, so you gotta be careful in that sense. Yeah. So this is also one of the uh, near Fukushima. So that's the bus stop. Mm. Uh, of course, I would like to take pictures with people, but you know, in in an in, in abandoned area, you find nobody. Yeah. Same here. That's uh, you know one of the home, homes. And this is going through, um, going into Fukushima. At that time, they were slowly opening up, but they only have a limited access. So what they do, they do, they, that's the Kaga counter as well. It reads okay. radiation for um, radioactive waves. And that's where they do the uh, clearing up of uh, decon uh, decontamination. And for these people, you know, who are going around to test, they do they stay long in the area? I mean, they they work in the morning. They start about seven in the morning. They finish about three o'clock. Okay. Yeah, but I know uh, many of them they they won't work there for too long. Maybe about three four months. Then they'll find something else. Same, they were rebuilding uh, the river track mm. because tsunami wiped out all the river tracks, so they're realigning it. So, this is the early morning that I was saying, you know, they start in the early morning, and um, this is um, seven in the morning, and this is in a contaminated area. Okay, and uh, they're doing exercises, you know, uh, in Japanese policy or Japanese company. Uh, every morning you do it, they have exercises. Yeah. Same, they were cutting grass and uh, they were, you know, clearing this old contaminated grass. Yeah. So on the background here, the blue bags here, these are all contaminated soil and grass. So these bags sort of, you know, hold the, the, the radiation level. Even though it's not 100% safe, because when, when you do your reading, it's still quite high. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's where they will, they will bury it. Okay. As you can see here, she's, she was doing the reading, and this is a reading about 2.5. Yeah. Three. It's quite high. Yeah. This is in Casanova. So Casanova, um, most places were, were destroyed. And what they did, they built again like containers and shops. So they were trying to bring back business. Okay. So, and, and Casanova is where, you know, you saw the, the big uh, fishing vessel. Yeah. Earlier shot. Yes, yeah. the, the, the area. And, and you do get uh, people from other parts of Japan or certain, or even out of, uh, of uh, Casanova. They take a drive there. So they have shops, you know, they try to, to get business going. Mm. This is in, in uh, Kiyamo, in Fukushima. So this is an indoor playground. Okay. Children were not allowed to play outside because of the level of uh, radioactive. Yeah. So they had buses that come on certain times for... for for different batch of children to play. Mm. And this was taken in Odaka. Odaka is about, uh, I think, 20 kilometers from uh, Fukushima. Um, so when this place was not affected by tsunami, it was affected by the explosion of uh, the power plant. Yeah. So after one 
0.5 years, one and a half years, it started to clear. So, you know, uh, before that, it was untouched. Nobody went into this place. Yeah. So they were having a break. This part of the house that was destroyed by tsunami. This was taken in Minami Soma. So uh, if you look at that, that's the power plant. Okay. That's yeah. pretty, yeah. Yeah, it's like about 15 kilometers away. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I was very close. I was like two kilometers away, but I could not get in. So, so this is um, the hospital in Minami Soma. So people go in to do their checks for whether they, are, whether they have radioactive in their body. Mm. So that's what they do. They check the growing area in the back. And then they will go to a uh, WBC, uh, it's called full body counter. Okay. It scans for two minutes and you'll get your results, whether you know you, you have radiation in, in your system. Yeah. And this is the town in Minami Soma, which is uh, people don't go back there anymore because it's very close, very near to the power plant. Mm. Again, this is one of the stations that are not used at all now during that time. But um, as you can see, uh, things are still going, see the time. Yeah. And this is because of the radi radiation, many people went out to protest, uh, asking the government or, or demand protest to shut down a power plant in Japan. From what I know, Japan has got 40 power plants. Okay. So, so the protest to, to shut it down. So I met a farmer. Um, he lives he lives in uh, Niamey, and that's on about twenty kilometers from Fukushima. Mm. He saw the explosion, you know, um, and he took a photo of it, and you know, it was so far away. He showed me the photo. Uh, it was um, when it when it exploded. Yeah. It was like a shape of a mushroom. Yeah. You know, and um, he evacuated. He got a big phone. And so when he stayed in the um, container homes, he later found out that his his cattle was being killed, being shot, without his knowledge. Okay. So he, he got a bit annoyed, so he went back and looked after them and, um, and his farm cannot, no longer can be used, it's, it's, uh, it's contaminated with yeah. So he now goes out and uh, he's an activist. Okay. So he goes out and protests and, and telling the government to shut down nuclear because uh, uh, it's not safe. So this was this was shot in Tokyo. Okay. And um, that's about it. Any thanks, Matthias, so much for uh, this presentation. Um, would anyone like to, you know, just ask any questions um, on the photos or, you know, uh, Matthias's experience? Do you have a favorite photo or do you have a, just one photo that really, you know, characterizes this conflict? Uh, what I like about my photo on, um, I like this photo. Mm. Because, again, this is a mystery as well. Um, this was shot in Naturi, 
Okay. And now three is quite a um, uh, quite a number, of, quite a main, quite a lot of people go there and pay their respect. It's a memorial ground. Okay. So when I was there, um, there were lots of people paying paying their respects. So I, you know, when everyone left, I just sat down because uh, they all driving and I was on a push bike, I was on a bicycle. So I, I just sat down and I just wanted to have a bit of a break. So I was sitting there on a grass patch and suddenly I, uh, I turned, I saw these two monks out of nowhere. And I, I can't explain because, uh, you know, there was no one actually and so, so out, of, out of sudden I saw these two monks. Mm. So just as they were doing their rites, and uh, I was sitting down and I took a shot, you know, so uh, so to me, I suppose I was meant to take a photo of them. Because out of, no, out, out of nowhere, you know, uh, I, I, almost everyone left and I saw these two monks. I was just sitting down, you know, because I had a long day. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this photo uh, uh, means a lot. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And it sort of tells the uh, the solitude of it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Willie asks if your camera system makes a difference to your style? Uh, yes, I would say so. Definitely. Because um, I shoot with a rangefinder. A rangefinder, when you use a rangefinder, you know, uh, you just take a, you know, what you see is not what you get because on your on your viewfinder it's got a, a window and you see whatever lens you fit, you see exactly what your eye sees, just a piece of glass. Yeah. So, which means when you start taking photos, you start to visualize and see how you think. Whereas if you fit, uh, uh, say, a DSR camera mm. and, and you fit whatever lens, it fit according to your your perspective or your, your lens. So if I fit a 50, it becomes a 50. So I only see a 50. So so by, by using a range finder and I take a photo, I see exactly how my eye sees. Mm. So which means I will see things differently. I will not see as, oh, because I'm using a 50 or using a 24 or, or, or 35 millimeter lens. But of course, I'm aware what lens I'm using but I'm seeing exactly how my eye sees. Mm. Yes, it changes your, your point of view. Thanks. Um, anyone else um, would like to say anything or ask a question? We will probably wrap up in a few minutes time. So if you have anything you wanna um, ask Matthias, please feel free to type in the chat box. Are you planning a trip back there soon? I mean, after this whole thing is over. No, I would like to. You know, I would, I would like to, to go back to, um, especially Fukushima. Yeah. Um, I would like to see what is it like, the progress of it. And of course, I would like to visit those people that I, I took photos of. Mm, yeah. Um, yes, there are many places I would like to go back. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, um, it's it's not going to be easy uh, because it brings back a lot of memories, uh, a lot of memories. Uh, there's another thing I'd like to also mention. Um, there's this lady I met, and uh -huh. uh, I met her in 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 a sort of a broken home. Yeah. The home was totally this, totally nothing, you know, and I talked to her, and uh, I just gave her my card, you know. And after one year, I went back for the the anniversary, eleventh mm. of March. And this guy was playing the guitar, and he had like before one minute silence. And suddenly, I I saw that lady. She just walked in front of me very slowly. And, yeah. she, and, and, and as she was walking, she pulled out my name card. 
at Hegeva. Yeah. It really got me by surprise because that's after a year. Yeah. And then she was crying, you know, and um, she was very emotional. Uh, I could not take a picture. I, um, I end up giving her a hug, you know, hug to comfort her. So uh, that really, I went soft in that sense, you know. So yeah, so yeah, I would like to, I like to see all these people back, and hope their life gets better, yeah. you know. And I'm sure things are things are better for them. I'm very sure. Mm. Yeah. Would you like to share what is your next assignment? Um, my next assignment, I. I at the moment, I have two assignments I'm doing. One is on shamanism, which I'm covering um, global, globally on shamanism. And another, another project I'm doing is Love and Lust. It's about uh, people expressing themselves through their body, a body of expression. Okay. So uh, it's not sexual, it's not, it's not it's not pornography, it's one expressing their body uh, through their expression, through their body. Okay. So don't, don't set it up, I just take it as the way they are. And of course, shamanism um, is, is a very, very old, uh, it's not even a religion, they, they believe in, in Mother Nature. Yeah. So shamanism, you know, they believe in, they, they, Believe in the ancestors, mm. yeah. so they can read. They have special uh, uh, gift whereby you know they can counteract uh, or rather can foresee if someone is is not well uh, through their ritual rites, or or they could counteract if someone is not well. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's about all that we have today. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for spending your afternoon with us. Um, and also, Matthias, thank you so much for, you know, sharing your photos and your experience with us today. Um, if there's anything that you need, please feel free to drop us an email or drop us a Facebook message and then we'll respond. Otherwise, uh, thank you all for joining us today at our session. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks. Thanks, Jim.